The great Paul Buckmaster, he worked with a lot of different artists, but really he made his mark with Elton John. When you hear the strings in Elton John's 70s stuff, chances are that's Paul Buckmaster just laying an extra layer of just brilliance. Caleb Coy talks about the late, great Paul Buckmaster, who we lost a few years ago, and what Paul taught him on Rock History Music. You know, I'm, I'm listening to... to uh... Uh, to Madman again, and and you know, uh, my God, the, his. It, I know he was all all over the place with with Elton, and I missed him. And he's in the, of course, the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When was that film? When did you guys get Paul Buckmaster? Gosh, that was about. Um, I can't remember the year he passed away, but it was about a year before he passed away. And um, so I'd been, I was in touch with him, and he was living out here at the time mm -hmm. he's been out, out here for quite a while so uh i was you know in touch with him for quite a bit um what was your impression of him when you first met him oh i love paul paul was amazing he was he was a mentor to us he was we used i mean we would talk music listen to music all the time have these listening parties you know uh and uh yeah he really he was really a great mentor to me in terms of classical music. But I, obviously, growing up in England, you're surrounded by classical music. And uh, some of it I liked, but I never really understood it. You know, when I met Paul, and of course, by then I was in my teenage years, you know, he helped me understand it. And was it was just a great time. Was it Paul that was uh, also on Friends? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, through that whole period, once Paul came on board, once he once we got hooked up with him, oh, everything from from the um, the Elton John album, you know, with the blackface, through to uh, it would be well, obviously, Madman, Tumbleweed, Madman, the Friends album it was all done during that that same time period. Was there anything different about Friends, considering it was for a film? Were any of those songs meant for, do you remember, for something else that they just, oh, let's, can, can, can I put you on? Let's, because that sounds like tumbleweed to me. Uh, yeah. Um, boy, that's a good question. As far as I remember, I think they were done specifically for the movie. But at the time, we were like, can I put you on? Um, and the tumbleweed. It was during this time period where we were influenced by a lot of American music, R&B, gospel, Leon Russell kind of thing, you know, Little Feet we were listening to. So I think those influences kind of bled into both camps, the yeah. Elton John album and the, and, and the Friends album. All of that music was was happening concurrently, you know. Elton's got enough, uh, easily enough country songs in his repertoire to to create to to uh, to release a few. I don't know why they've never released like Country Comfort and every album, uh, true. Texan love song. I mean, there, there's so many. That's country. true. Because oh, I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I think most probably. I think if that had happened, this is just my opinion. If that had ha happened he would have most probably become a big country star had a hit you know one of them would have hit you know in the country market you know and he'd been rhinestones for the rest of his life or something you know <laughs> on the, the 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 debut album well it wasn't the debut album empty sky the the second project i mean obviously there was money there what was mm -hmm. that how was that different from uh what was the atmosphere as opposed to the one that you did with elton before that that resurfaced last year what was with Steve um, Brown. Oh, it was a lot of fun. It was a great, great atmosphere. Steve, Steve Brown actually produced it. I just played guitar on it. Because at that time, um, Hookfoot had formed at that time. So we were, I was, you know, my, my energies were focused on developing Hookfoot. Uh, but we were still, you know, we was, Hookfoot was signed to Dick James. So we were like stable mates, as they call it. Um, and so, but S Steve Brown had taken over the production of things and, um, Steve was really, um, instrumental in encouraging, uh, Reg and Bernie at that time 
to write what they felt rather than try and copy anybody else. See, there, there was um, a bit of a battle going on, an ideological battle going on between Dick James himself and us, Reg and Bernie and us. Dick was old school. He was from my father's generation. And the buzzword for him was commercial. It's got to be commercial. It's got to be commercial. And so he's, you know, he's telling, can't you write something like Tom Jones or Engelbert Humperdinck or something? Or we're just like scratching our heads going, give me a break, you know. And um, so Steve came along and he he really encouraged, uh, you know, all of us actually to just just write what we felt, you know, which is what we did. So Empty Sky was like the first foray into this new kind of a thing. You know, and so it was fun. It, it was just great. You know, <clears throat> Dick James gave him the green light to go ahead with it. And so we did, you know. We'll have more from Caleb Quay coming up tomorrow. Remember, his documentary is available on YouTube. The link to it, it's a great documentary, is in the description of this video. Remember, if you want to support the channel, there are many ways you can do that. You can subscribe to our channel, of course, share our videos, comment on them, like them. There are links in the description where you can make a donation or join our Patreon. Spread the word, baby. We'd love that. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Take care of yourself.